Greetings, friends. Welcome to this uh, second part of the summary of my sermon given uh, on the 20th Sunday after Trinity at St. Andrew's Church, sponsored by the Anglican Orthodox Communion worldwide. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your kindness towards us, for your love, for your patience and understanding. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your only begotten Son to us to be a ransom for us, a Redeemer, a Savior. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us aware of our own depravity former, uh, prior to coming to you, uh, a depravity that uh, disqualifies us for ever being with you. We thank you for that white robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ purchased at Calvary for us. We ask you, Lord, to give us that robe, for we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel is uh, written in Matthew, the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Jesus so often spoke in parables so that those whose hearts are open and humble might understand. And so those whose hearts were arrogant, proud, and hardened would not so understand. We understand as much truth as we are willing to digest. It was against the interest of the world, the interest of the, uh, of the uh, rulers of the Jews to understand. And so they blinded their own eyes to the profound truth of who Jesus was. I believe that they really knew who he was. The arrogance of the mind despises mystery. It must pry into every mystery and pretentiously invent its secrets. We stake out our gardens of theology and plant respectively our trees of Calvin, Arminius, or some other, while refusing to hear any contrary points from Scripture to understand them. We will accept only those parts of Scripture that will water our own preferred trees of theology. But Christ, in his parable, is a revealer of mystery to the open hearts of the faithful and a concealer of mystery to those who proudly assert their own opinions to the detriment of faith. The sermon text today is of a great man who was planning a grand wedding feast for his son. He had gone to great expense and time-consuming preparation to ensure that every detail was perfect. So Jesus opens the parable with a story of a marriage feast. Marriage is so important to Christ that he performed his first miracle at Cana of Galilee, which was or happened to be a wedding feast, a marriage feast. From the inception, as the first institution of God in the Garden of Eden, marriage has been sacred and holy to God, and it must be to us as well. It is an earthly model for the kingdom of God, and the great marriage between Christ and his bride is the church. Let's examine the nature, first of all, of this invitation. Number one, it is extended to everyone wide and far, even though some will not accept. It will be, re number two, it will be rejected by the heartless and indifferent. Number three, rejection provokes the justifiable anger of God. Each of us exists either under his kind favor or under his great anger. Under God's anger or under God's love, we must exist one way or the other, whether we will or not. We cannot flee from his presence. We cannot go from his spirit. If we are loving and so rise up to heaven, God is there in love. If, on the other hand, we are cruel and wrathful, wrathful and so go down to hell, God is there also in wrath. With the clean, he will be clean. With the froward man, he will be froward. On us and us alone, it depends whether we shall live under God's anger or live under God's love. The first verse of our gospel text reads, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage supper for his son. This certain king is God the Father. Do I need to tell you who the son represents? 
none other than Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Verse 2, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. The great prophets were these servants who called those who were bidden to come, but Israel would not hear them and did not come. They even stoned many of these prophet uh, messengers, and others they sawed in half. Then again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. The great king leaves nothing to chance. He prepares all we need for our comfort and our nourishment and joy. The sacrifice has already been made for us. All we must do is come. He decides to honor us by allowing us to honor his beloved son. Verse 3, but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Here we see the dreadful preoccupation of the world and even the church with our own devices, money, trade, and barter, etc. The service to God seems to light things, uh, seems a light thing to them. We today are sorrowful, we, no different. We do not, we do our duty, the minimum that we have to do, in attending service once on Sunday. Then we go back to our troughs and mud and live as if God were not watching. Verse 4, And the remnant took his servants and entreated them uh, spitefully and slew them. You will recall how wrongly they treated Samuel, Moses, Jeremiah, and even Abel, and all the prophets. Even Abel was slain by his brother for living and teaching righteousness. The apostles, most of whom died brutal deaths, were no less dishonored by those who knew no honor. Verse 5, But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their church, or their, I'm sorry, their city, if you have uh, been living under the delusion that God will always show mercy and kindness, you're wrong. Christ himself shall return to claim his own, and the remainder shall be put to the sword and cast into hell without mercy. They will have sealed their own fate through the neglect of the things of God. If you have not loved God in this life, you cannot love him in the next. The tares, that is, the unbelievers, shall be gathered by the holy angels and burned. Verse 6 tells us, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Most of Israel depended upon their pedigree as sons of Abraham. However, they did not rightfully belong to the Old Testament church of Abraham, who looked to the coming of Christ as the fulfillment of the promise made. These being rejected, God turns to all who will come and who love Christ are adopted into that great church and are Israel indeed. None are to go without an invitation. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. This is like the great dragnet of souls mentioned in Matthew 13, 47 and 48. It drew every kind of fish, both good and bad, and the fishermen, the angels, sat down and separated them, or uh, the fields of wheat and tires growing together, picture this same truth. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the man, or I'm sorry, then said the king uh, to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do we desire to be um, properly attired at this great and distinguished feast that we're going to face at the end of days? If so, 
we must take on the white robe of righteousness, which Christ offers to cover our rags and filth. The prodigal son received that robe from his father on his return from feeding the pigs in a far country. And in that day, in Isaiah uh, 4, 1, we read, And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. These are the seven churches, I humbly believe, who wish to be nominal Christians only that are mentioned in the book of Revelations. They will eat their own bread and not the bread of heaven, he offers and will wear their own filthy rags of sin instead of his robe of righteousness. But they desire the dignity of being called only by his name. For many are called, but few are chosen. Fred, it is quite possible that you've been called and invited, but never accepted the invitation. A gift may be offered, but it is not fully a gift until it has been received. Have you accepted with serious heart and intent? the redemption made available through the blood of Christ. Are you of that few who are both called and chosen? Or have you left the forgotten invitation among all of the worldly papers that clutter your desk? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.